Welcome to the Bible Answer Man broadcast with Christian Research Institute President Hank Hanegraaff. Our mission at CRI is not only to equip you with Christian doctrine, apologetic accuracy, and discernment, but to help you become a faithful apprentice of Jesus Christ because life and truth matter. If you'd like to know more about CRI and the Bible Answer Man broadcast, call 888-7000-CRI, 888-7000-CRI, or go to our website at equip.org. That's equip.org. And now, here's Hank Hanegraaff. Thank you very much, Randy. As always, it is such a pleasure, uh, such a privilege to be in studio to answer your questions throughout the United States, Canada, and indeed questions that come in from around the world. A lot of you hanging on. We'll go right to the phone calls. Go to Nate in Omaha, Nebraska. Hi. Hi, Hank. My question is about Revelation chapter 20. I believe that I heard that your view was that you are not to take uh, Satan being bound for a thousand years literally. Am I correct? Well, yeah, I think that if you are familiar with Revelation chapter 20, the chapter itself, uh, not only the chapter but the book, is replete with figurative language. And then on top of it, if you look at the fact that a thousand used as a whole number is typically in the whole of Scripture used in a figurative way, it seems odd that you would be reading this in a wooden literalistic fashion in John's revelation or the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. I guess my question is um, addressing that he'll be let loose once more after we reign with Christ for a thousand years. Because it says in chapter 20, verse 7, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out and deceive the nations. John wants his readers to understand that the Great Tribulation is viewed in scope of a larger vindication. And so in Revelation, John recapitulates the story of Christ's victory over Satan, uh, the reality that he's bound for a thousand years. And he wants them to never forget that, like John the Baptist, they might be persecuted and killed. But, but ultimately what that means is that through the power of resurrection, they will rule and reign with Christ forever. So in the grand scope of things, what's going on is you have uh, people who are going to suffer, but Satan is going to be loosed for a short period of time, but in the end they're going to be eternally vindicated. And that's not the way it is going to be for the principles of Satan's kingdom who have taken the mark of the beast. Their physical death, of course, marks the beginning of their eternal judgment, and uh, they're spiritually dead. They're, They're not going to be physically revived until Jesus appears a second time at the second resurrection of the dead. So Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years, and those who have not taken his mark will rule forever. So Satan's defeat is complete, as is their victory and their vindication. Let's go back to the phone lines. We'll talk next to James in Fayetteville, North Carolina, listening on Sirius XM 131. Hi, James. Good afternoon, Hank. I'm a long-time listener, and uh, over the years, I really have learned a whole lot. Thank you. You got it. My question tonight is coming from Luke 16, the first and 13, uh, the unjust steward. And I was trying to get a understanding of the parable, and uh, I I thought about Matthew 6, where God is talking about you can't serve mammon and God, and I'm I'm wondering, are those two related? Can you kind of explain the parable for me? Well, the takeaway of the parable is just as the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly, so the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. So what's being pointed to is the shrewdness of the sons of darkness, and that's contrasted with the shrewdness that should be demonstrated by the sons of light, but in a sanctified biblical worldview sense. So the point of this parable is that the unrighteous are better at using money to make friends in the world than believers are at using money to make friends for the kingdom of God, which is accomplished by spending your resources on the needy, using your time, talent, and treasure for the extension of his kingdom. And at death, of course, the needy are going to welcome their benefactors into the everlasting kingdom. So what is done 
from the standpoint of those who do it for the kingdom of light has eternal significance. And yet, we often see the people in the world being shrewder in terms of what they're doing with their money than the sons of light. Okay, well, thank you. You got it. Thank you for your call. Back to the phone lines. We'll talk to Denise next in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Hi, Denise. Hi, Hank. Thank you for taking my call. I really appreciate it. I started going to a oneness church. I really didn't, I guess, understand what that meant. But I've been going there for about two and a half years. But I'm really confused as to their beliefs. They don't believe in the Trinity. And I just would like, I guess, another opinion about it. I'm just confused, and I'm praying uh, that God will reveal just the truth to me. Sure. What oneness Pentecostals have done is remake God in an image that they can comprehend, whereas Trinitarians say that God is incomprehensible. He is beyond our ken. We cannot know him fully in this life, nor will we fully know him in the life to come. We will continue to grow in our knowledge of God because God is infinite. So what we have done as biblical believers is bow our knee before God's revelation of himself to us in the scriptures. And the oneness Pentecostals, by and large, don't like that at all. And so they say that if you teach the Trinitarian doctrine, which is derived from scripture, then you have, in fact, bought into pagan polytheistic philosophy. So they're very, very strident when they emerged, particularly against Trinitarianism. When they emerged, they emerged within Pentecostalism, and the Assemblies of God denounced them as a heretical group because they were saying that what the Assembly of God believed with respect to the Trinity was heresy. So the Assemblies of God in turn said, no, what you're teaching is heresy. And the Assemblies of God was right, because what we're teaching is simply what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? There's only one God. So as Christians, we're fiercely monotheistic. Then we say that the Father is God, because the Bible says that. The Son is God. The Bible's very, very clear about that. The Holy Spirit is God. Bible equally clear. And then the Christian scriptures teach us that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are eternally distinct. Now, the Pentecostals cannot comprehend that, and neither can the Trinitarians. So in both cases, the oneness Pentecostals have to say, I don't get it. But the Christians say the exact same thing. They say, I don't get it either. But in the one case, you have the oneness Pentecostals refashioning God in something that is understandable, and the Trinitarians saying, look, God is beyond my ken, and I'm completely satisfied with that. I'm going to bow before his self-revelation. I'm not going to refashion him. Now, the Trinity is obviously not illogical. It's simply incomprehensible. And so we merely apprehend what Scripture says as opposed to comprehending what Scripture says. Can I cut my hair and wear pants as a woman and go to heaven? Absolutely. And this is another problem with one is Pentecostalism. It holds to a litany of legalistic prescriptions, including the kinds of things that you're talking about, rebaptism by their formula with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And you can imagine all of this collectively has placed enormous social psychological pressure on adherents like yourself, because if you don't abide by their legalism, then you're afraid that you won't make it into heaven. And it's simply false. The Bible is not about legalistic prescriptions. What the Bible's ultimately about is following Jesus Christ in the principles and precepts of the kingdom because you know that the king knows what's best for you. Oh, thank you. That was a very great explanation, and I do bless your ministry. Thank you, Hank. You got it, Denise. Thank you so much for your call. Uh, we'll go back to the phone lines now, talk to Thomas. He's listening in Knoxville, Tennessee. Hi. Yes, sir. A couple of years ago, I caught the tail end of the conversation, so I didn't get to hear the first part of it. But essentially, you were saying that, and I'm just calling to see if you can clarify it, you were saying that the Nephilim were a myth? Well, no, I'm not saying that the Nephilim are a myth. What I'm saying is what is mythology rather than theology is to suppose that angels can have sex with women and through that produce the Nephilim. 
That's not what happened, nor is that the context of Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 is a judgment on human beings who have fallen, and the judgment comes through the flood. Okay. I appreciate you clarifying that for me, sir. You got it. Thank you so much for your call, and I've written about this because a lot of people of the years have asked me, did demons have sexual relations with women in Genesis chapter 6? The answer is absolutely not. That's not what the chapter is about. And if demons or fallen angels could have sex with women, then they could have sex with women now. This is a imposition of mythology on to Scripture as opposed to extracting out of Scripture pure, unadulterated theology. So one is a myth, the other is what you derive by studying the Word of God, not reading something into the Word of God that has no place in the whole sequence of that which corresponds to reality. Be right back in just a few moments with more answers to your questions on the Bible. The prophet Isaiah declared, this is the way, walk in it. The way Isaiah was speaking of is the way of the cross, God's way to the good and beautiful life. In their new book, The Cross Before Me, Pastor Rankin Wilburn and philosopher Brian Greger explain that the call to Christ's cross is in fact a call to love, joy, and peace not just for eternity, but for life today, here and now. Be sure to read The Cross Before Me. To receive your copy, call 888-7000-CRI and support the life-changing work of the Christian Research Institute. That's 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. We'll return shortly with more from Hank Hanegraaff. God spoken? Are the words of Scripture merely human in origin, or are they in fact the very words of God Himself? Three years in the making and based on two decades of research and reflection, Hank Hanegraaff's monumental book, Has God Spoken?, answers what is surely the most important question facing our world. In Has God Spoken? Memorable Proofs of the Bible's Divine Inspiration, Hank counters the contentions of the Bible attackers and clearly shows that belief in the Holy Scriptures is not a guess or wishful thinking. It is the only logical conclusion after an honest examination of overwhelming evidence. Order Has God Spoken? from the Christian Research Institute by calling 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. Equip. In the new book, The Cross Before Me, Pastor Rankin Wilborn and philosopher Brian Greger offer a provocative perspective on why the cross is not just the way to salvation, but the way to the abundant life. Drawing on biblical truth and historical writings, they ask, why do we still feel restless when things seem to be going our way? How can suffering bring more peace than success brings? And what does Jesus' cross teach us about how to live a full and flourishing life? This unique book helps us reimagine the good life as we learn to delight in surrendering our own power and embracing the life-giving weakness of the cross. Be sure to read The Cross Before Me. To receive your copy, call 888-7000-CRI and support the life-changing work of the Christian Research Institute. That's 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. The Christian Research Journal is CRI's award-winning magazine, combining eye-catching design with well-researched articles to equip believers in doctrine, defense, and discernment. The Christian Research Journal's primary commitment is to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. In keeping with this commitment, the journal's mission is both evangelistic and pastoral, furthering the proclamation and defense of the historic gospel of Jesus Christ and helping his followers distinguish between essential Christian doctrine and doctrine that is peripheral, aberrant, or heretical. In an age of subjectivism and moral relativism, may Christians ground their faith and values in the objective, reliable testimony of Holy Scripture. Start your subscription to the Christian Research Journal today. Call 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. That's equip.org.
Now back to the Bible Answer Man broadcast and your host, Hank Hanegraaff. Thank you much, Randy. Back to the phone lines. We'll talk next to Jim. He's listening in St. Louis, Missouri. Hi, Jim. Hi, Hank. Thank you for taking my call. I'm having a problem reconciling that most of the people in my church are pro-death penalty and pro Done. They believe that, you know, the Second Amendment is almost Scripture. And I just have problems reconciling that with exactly what you were saying about how Christianity is a religion of love and peace. Well, sure. Capital punishment, and however it is given, you can look at capital punishment for a capital crime. This is something that is maybe a differing of opinion on the part of Christians. Some believe in capital punishment as a universal imperative. Others say that it had its time and has been abrogated. But the idea here is that if someone kills another person, they're taking the life of someone who is created in the image and likeness of God, and therefore their life would be required of them. Doesn't mean that they couldn't have life in the life to come, they will have, either with the Lord or apart from the Lord. Repentance is always a possibility. But abortion is far different than that. Abortion is the painful killing of an innocent human being. There's no warrant for that whatsoever. I've pointed out many times on the broadcast that the zygote fulfills the criteria that's needed to establish the existence of biological life. It has metabolism, it has development, it has the ability to react to stimuli, cell reproduction, and the like. And therefore, we can say that taking the life of a preborn child is the painful killing of an innocent human being. But bearing arms is a far different category. No Christian is for killing people without any warrant. Uh, Christians that believe in bearing arms believe that guns can be used for protection. It isn't a gun, ultimately, that kills a person. It is a person who has a gun in hand that kills another person. So guns can be used for self-defense just as they can be used as a great moral evil. And again, the whole idea of bearing and keeping arms is debated within Christian circles. We did an article in the Christian Research Journal in which we had two very well-qualified Christians on either side of the debate, and you can find that on the web at equip.org. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You got it. Thanks for your call. Back to the phone lines. Israel, listening in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Hi. Hello, Hank. God bless you. God bless you. I'm actually going to have a meeting with a Muslim that was actually my high school teacher. Mm -hmm. What's the best translation to get of the Quran and also like the Hadith? Well, when you say the Hadith, I mean, there are lots of Hadiths, and some are considered more credible than others. But with respect to the Quran, you know, the one that I like to use, it's by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. And I like it very much because of the notes. The notes are very relevant and very enlightening, and that's the reason I use that particular version of the Quran. But the most accurate English translation that's readable would be by N.J. Dawood, who has got a copy that most Muslims dislike because he himself was not a Muslim. But it's very clear. If you read the translation that I'm talking about, it's marred by the pseudo-King James English and therefore becomes somewhat oppressive and difficult sometimes to make sense of. Okay. Yeah, and I picked up the book of the best of the Christian Research Journal, What You Need to Know About Islam. Very I'm helpful. About to, uh, I'm, a, I'm almost done with that, as a matter of fact, but I, I actually wanted to uh, read this first, the, that um, the book aforementioned first, before I had the meeting with him. Uh-huh. Um, and then I was going to ask him the same question, you know, but um, I'm going to ask him questions about his faith. Try not to, like, have a closed-minded discussion, but just have an open-end question, but I'm really just going to ask him questions and then try to use that as a springboard um, when the opportunity presents itself. But do you think that would be a good uh, tactic to go about the, the meeting with him? Well, it's probably not how the conversation is going to go, and what you want to have is a dialogue, not a monologue, nor do you want to just be peppering him with questions. But I do think that you want to stay on point, and the, the most significant point is 
who is Jesus Christ? For a Muslim, they will say he was a great moral teacher, but he is not as great as Muhammad. And they certainly do not think that he is God in human flesh. In fact, they believe that the Christian view that Jesus Christ is God is the committing of an unforgivable sin, what's called the unforgivable sin of shirk. An attendant question, of course, has to do with what you were talking about earlier, and that is the Quran. How does it stack up in terms of being correct vis-a-vis something like the Bible? The Bible has been demonstrated to be correct in even its minute details. So with archaeology, for example, the people, the places, and the particulars of Scripture have found to be in correspondence with reality. Whereas the Quran is replete with not only faulty ethics, but also factual errors, not the least of which is the fact that the Quran denies the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And this is a problem for the Quran because as science has continued, we have more and more evidence for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in terms of its actual details, but we also have the history. And the history points back to Jesus Christ as a real human being who was really crucified. And this is conceded not just internally in the scriptures, but also by external witnesses like Tacitus, the great Roman historian, or Pliny the Younger, or Josephus. There are many external witnesses to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, the secular historians don't consider him God, but they do believe that he was crucified because all of the evidence points in that direction. There's ample historical validation for that. So the Quran makes huge, huge errors in terms of factual information, in terms of ethics. I mean, you have all kinds of things that could be pointed to. You can point to the fact that Muhammad allowed men to marry one, two, three, four women of their choice. And he himself took a special dispensation from God, whereas he could marry many women. And one of the women he married was only six years old, Aisha. And he consummated the marriage when she was just nine years old. Now, that's not my opinion. That's the opinion of the most reliable resources that are available. Now, we would call that in our society pedophilia. And so you look at the faulty ethics of the Quran compared to the kinds of ethics and mores that you find in Scripture. That's the difference between night and day. Okay, I appreciate that, Hank. So the real point is, who is Jesus Christ? Let's go back to the phone lines. We'll talk next to Connie. She's listening in Springfield, Missouri. Hi. Hi. I have a debate with a friend who belongs to a very liberal church organization. Um, He feels like that marriage is simply a certificate made by modern man. He does not feel that it's biblically based, that it's not necessary for man and woman to live together and be married in the church. Um, Just needed your opinion on that. Well, I think that the Bible is very, very clear about marriage. It's parabolic because it is the union of Christ and the Church. And so you look at the union of Christ and the Church, and that same commitment is required of a man with a woman and vice versa. Secondly, it is for psychophysical pleasure. And thirdly, it is for the propagation of the human race, which can only be done within the commitment of marriage bond. And the Bible is very, very clear. Jesus establishing the doctrine of marriage on Adam and Eve, uh, the first man and the first woman. And so the idea that you can live with a woman without marrying a woman is really what Scripture refers to as fornication. And this is the illicit sexual intercourse that takes place when people are not married because sexual intercourse is only to take place within the context of marriage. So while in certain contexts you can talk about fornication as adultery, elsewhere it's distinguished from adultery, but the bottom line is we cannot have, from a biblical perspective, relations with a woman without having commitment to that woman until death do us part. Okay. Thank you, sir. You got it. And you know, commitment is critical. 
It's critical in the Christian life. It's not just a feeling. Commitment is saying, I'm going to follow the precepts and principles of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And in our individual lives, when we marry someone, it's not about a feeling, it's about a commitment. I'm going to be committed to you in sickness and in health, for better or worse, until death do us part. And that commitment, you can't walk away from. Whereas if you're living with someone, when things get tough, easy to walk away. And now you're using someone as opposed to cherishing someone. So the biblical paradigm is most clearly marriage. And that not to a lot of women as Muhammad was, but only to one wife. We're out of time for this edition of the Bible Lens Man broadcast. We'll be right back tomorrow with more. Lord willing, stay tuned for that. We appreciate you tuning in to the Bible Answer Man broadcast. Before we sign off today, here's our contact information. By phone, dial 888-7000-CRI, which translates to 888-7000-274. On the internet, go to equip.org. That's equip.org. You can also write CRI at Post Office Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina. The zip code is 28271. Our prayer is that today's broadcast has equipped you to better defend your faith and encouraged you to pursue sound doctrine and godly living. Thank you for listening. The Bible Answer Man broadcast is supported solely by listeners like you. We're on the air because life and truth matter. In the new book, The Cross Before Me, Pastor Rankin Wilborn and philosopher Brian Greger offer a provocative perspective on why the cross is not just the way to salvation, but the way to the abundant life. Drawing on biblical truth and historical writings, they ask, why do we still feel restless when things seem to be going our way? How can suffering bring more peace than success brings? And what does Jesus' cross teach us about how to live a full and flourishing life? This unique book helps us reimagine the good life as we learn to delight in surrendering our own power and embracing the life-giving weakness of the cross. Be sure to read The Cross Before Me. To receive your copy, call 888-7000-CRI and support the life-changing work of the Christian Research Institute. That's 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org.